Okay, welcome to our first video of what is Jamie thinking when he gives us these PowerPoints. Well, I want to explain to you exactly what I am thinking, and that's why we're here today. So uh, buckle up. Uh, lap belts and shoulder harnesses on this video. We're getting on board to see how the aircraft operates under powered and unpowered flight. And how are you guys doing today? I hope you're feeling fine. The sun is out here in calendar. I'm looking out the window at some a little bit of snow and a lot of sunshine. So I'm going to try to get this done so that you can get outside too and enjoy the day. All right, first picture we're looking at here, the first slide, uh, we're looking at the rotor and the airflow and how it's visualized as it moves through the rotor under powered flight. So we've already studied a little bit about what's happening in a hover. And you know that in a hover, we're getting a lot of vortices built up uh, at the tips of the blades, as well as the air is being pulled down through the rotor. So it's as the aircraft moves from hover to forward flight that you start to see this pattern of airflow and the pattern of airflow coming in, being pulled into the rotor in sort of this fashion where it's going to come down in the back a little bit at a high, higher angle than at the front. All right, and as the aircraft push through, pushes through that at around 10 to 15 knots, that airflow starts to become a bit more horizontal into the rotor, but you can still see some tip vortices at the rear of the rotor. So let's see what happens once you hit around the 15 to 25 knot scenario. Uh, you can see that the airflow is now coming in at a horizontal flow in through the rotor and there's no tip vortices anymore. So we've got rid of all that bad air to make lift with and we've got nothing but good air being pushed into the rotor system. So that's called translational lift and you can see I've written it up here, translational lift. So it is a good thing for the aircraft and once the aircraft moves into this translational lift you get nice smooth airflow. The aircraft vibrations will start to go away because now each blade is going to be making the same amount of lift without any turbulence causing these vibrations because of unequal lift. All right, So hopefully that makes sense and that's a good thing for the aircraft. Now if you continue to go faster and faster, eventually you start to build up a lot of parasitic drag on the aircraft, around the 60 miles an hour. And then uh, the aircraft is not getting its full range, but it's, it's going to be moving at a quick pace. Most of the helicopters fly at around 100 miles an hour, um, up to around 140 miles an hour for most, com most commercial helicopters. Um, once you push past that, eventually the, the rotor system won't be designed to be able to handle the, the loading. And this is the reason why. Now we talked more about the uh, dissymmetry of lift in forward flight. The advancing blade has more airflow coming into it. Okay, so it's going against the wind, whereas the retreating blade, remember we were saying that the rotor spins looking downwards counterclockwise the retreating blade is going with the wind. So that means we have a reduction of airflow moving over the surface of the airfoil, which means it can't create as much lift. So what happens is the blade has to then flap down for the retreating blade. And when it flaps down, now you're getting a, a higher angle of attack so that the blade can compensate for that loss in airflow. And that's done through the flapping hinge, which we learned about in lesson one. Now eventually if the aircraft goes too fast, you won't have either enough airflow or you'll have too high an angle of attack on the blade and the blade will stall. So if I zoom in a bit on this, you can see on the advancing blade, we're only running around two or four degrees out at the tip. But if you look at the retreating blade, it's sitting at 16 degrees, 14 degrees, 12 degrees. Now, of course, because of the blade twist, it gets reduced, but uh, you know, you can see there that there's there's uh, quite a high angle of attack. And we know that stalls come from too low of airspeed or too high an angle of attack. And that's where we get our stall from. Okay, and that happens out at the tip and eventually starts to increase and increase and increase until it affects the rotor system and the lift it can, can uh, uh, develop. All right, the next one, next slide I wanted to talk about was powered flight and unpowered flight. And we call that auto rotation. And auto rotation, the airflow is kind of taking a little bit of a different path 
as compared to powered flight. Powered flight, you can see in this slide number one, is the airflow is going down through the rotor, and slide two is coming up through the rotor. So during auto rotation, it works a lot like an auto gyro. So if you want to read up a little bit more on auto gyros, that'll explain um, how they work. But where they get their lift is, yeah, the rotor is turning, and an auto gyro doesn't have a motor driving the blades. And so effectively, if the engine quits on a helicopter, it's just turning into an auto gyro. Uh, and um, the airflow coming up through the rotor will then drive the rotor and keep it spinning. In order for this to happen, the engine needs to be disconnected from the transmission. And that's through the use of something called a freewheeling unit. And that freewheeling unit is, uh, I like to say that it's something like taking a, the, you know, the, a dead, dumping the dead elephant or getting the dead elephant off your back. All right, so if the engine is still connected to the rotor system and you're trying to keep the rotor turning, that's going to create a lot of uh, loss and power drag, essentially. It's going to create a lot of drag on the rotor system. It's going to slow it down. So we don't want that. So there has to be this automatic method to disconnect the engine from the transmission so that that engine doesn't try to slow the rotor down. And that's through the use of the freewheeling unit. The freewheeling unit has these sprags. And these sprags um, are, have a longer profile than what the spacing is between the outer and the inner housings. So when they're rotating, so if we have a driving force on the outer race of this uh, sprag clutch, you can see that we're effectively jamming these sprags and locking them in place. And this will transfer the power into the center shaft. So the center shaft will begin to rotate. Now, if for some reason the outer drive, okay, so if this outer race somehow locks up or quits, or if the, you know, whatever's driving it, like the engine quits, the inner race will be able to continue to turn. You can see that here. So what will happen is the sprags will lay down and it will be able to continue to turn. All right, next slide. So during auto rotation, uh, the relative wind is coming in at a different angle. So during normal power flight, we're looking at the relative wind. It's, you know, coming in at a, a fair, you know, fairly horizontal. There's some small variations there with the blade flapping up and down. Um, but in an auto rotation, we have a lot of induced flow. So the air is coming from below. And if the air is coming from below, that means my relative wind is no longer coming in horizontal. It's coming in on an angle. And what that does is it takes our lift. If we look over here, you can see lift is at right angles to the relative wind. And if you change that relative wind, you're going to change the lift. And you can see the lift is now forward of this imaginary line here that I put in there. And that's to indicate the axis of rotation. So if it's pointing forward, right, that is going to help the lift to pull the airfoil forward. Of course, we have to include drag into this. So you can see we've got the combination of lift and drag create this total aerodynamic force. And that is the force that we want forward of the axis of rotation. If you look and you compare the total aerodynamic force of the auto rotative and the powered flight pictures here, you can see that the total aer aerodynamic force is aft of the axis of rotation. And that's going to basically mean that there's going to be uh, a, a moment of force that's going to try to slow the rotor system down. So the engine compensates for that. But in auto rotation, we have no engine. So then the uh, aerodynamic force is forward of the axis of rotation. And that is going to drive the main rotor and keep the main rotor RPM steady. I'll tell you, if I'm ever in uh, two different aircraft, one's a fixed wing, one's a rotary wing, and the engine quits, I want to be in the rotary wing. And this is the reason why.
So looking at the next slide here, there's different regions of the blade. And we're getting a little deep, but it kind of just shows you the difference between all th all three regions um, and why some have the total aer aerodynamic force forward of the axis rotation and other regions have it aft. Let's take a look at that and we'll just zoom in a little bit. So out at the tip, all right, we're making we've got a well first we got a lot of airflow because it, the tip is spinning at a higher it has more airflow over the tip than it does at the root so we've got a lot of lift being created all right but because of the higher air speeds moving over top of it we've got a higher component of drag and as you can see where's the total aerodynamic force is it pointing forward or aft and you can see that it's clear pointing aft so that means it's going to provide no forward pull to the blade during auto rotation. Now looking at the driving region, the driving region has a fair amount of lift but less drag because we don't have as much um, airflow over it. What that does is the combination of the two helps to pull that total aerodynamic force into the neutral position. All right, So this is at the beginning right here and the end here of the driving region. Now, C is showing us where the total aerodynamic is actually fully ahead of the axis of rotation and that is going to be where all the pulling force is to keep that blade spinning and not slowing down. So it's very important that when the engine quits the pilot responds very very quickly to get rid of any unnecessary uh, collective input put it all the way to the bottom and uh, maintain that RPM. So once you lose that RPM, there's no recovering from it. Once it drops below, I think it's around like 88% RPM, you will never recover from that in an auto rotation. I'm sure there's pilots out there that have some tricks, but just in general, it's really hard to get the RPM back once you lose it. And then if we look at the stall region here, that's referring to E, and you can see that we're not creating a lot of lift because the airfoil is uh, not getting a lot of airflow across it, but we are creating a lot of drag. So that means the combination of the drag, our total aerodynamic force, which I'm going to now erase for you, is pointing aft. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. It's not erasing for me. Here, we'll get rid of all the ink on the screen. And you can see that the total aerodynamic force is aft of the axis of rotation. So hopefully that explains a little bit more about auto rotation. Um, it is an amazing method to keeping the aircraft uh, kind of floating in the air while it gives the pilot time to find a place to land and slows the rate of descent of the aircraft. So thanks for listening, and uh, we might meet again.